Good evening, everyone. Welcome back to Money Maimonides. Nice to see all of you. Before we begin our lecture tonight, I want to note that this Shior has been sponsored by Edith Feiger in commemoration of her mother-in-law, Serena Feiger, Zichron Alavarcha. So we greatly appreciate Edith's sponsorship. Thank you so much, Edith. And may you be married to be well and happy and healthy for many years. And may your mother-in-law get much nachat from the Torah that we learned tonight. So we are tonight really picking up a conversation that we began last week, that we sort of ended off with. And I guess I could phrase the, uh, the question as follows, okay? So let's say it this way. You're uh, walking back from work, you're tired, you're hungry, you really could use a nice bite of something, and you're walking by and you see a Cinnabon, a non-kosher Cinnabon. And you're looking at the window and you're thinking in the back of your mind, you know what, I could really go for one of those non-kosher cinnamon buns right about now. But of course, of course, we're all wonderful Jewish people here. We're all committed to following Torah and mitzvot. And we're not going to partake of something without good kosher authorization, certification. So you're not going to eat from that Cinnabon. I'm taking that as a given. Of course not. I would never suspect anyone here of doing such a thing. My question is, what are you telling yourself or what should you be telling yourself in your head? Are you telling yourself in your head, man, I wish I could have that Cinnabon. It would be awesome to enjoy a nice cinnamon bun right now. But alas, the Torah, God, has forbidden me from eating it. And I have to listen to Hashem. Or do you say, you know what? You know what? Really? I don't want that cinnamon. I don't want it. It's not for me. Because if Hashem said, that I'm not supposed to eat that Cinnabon, it must be Cinnabons, non-kosher Cinnabon. I will say, I was recently in New Jersey and they had this you know, new mall and apparently the Cinnabon in the new big mall in New Jersey is kosher. So there is such a thing. But assuming that this Cinnabon is not kosher, Hashem doesn't want it for me. I don't want it either. And that's the question. What is more admirable? What should we say? Is it better to want the Cinnabon and say, I can't have it because Hashem doesn't want me to have it, but I want it? Or is it better to say, eh, yuck, Cinnabon? If Hashem says no, ugh, I don't even have an appetite for it. Before- so that was the question we raised last week. And if you remember, we'll read it again inside that the Rambam saw this as a conflict, a conflict between two sources. Or on the one hand, you had the quote-unquote philosophers, the sages, not the sages, Jewish sages, but philosophers, who say that it is better not to even desire the actions that we deem sinful or negative. You shouldn't even want it, even if a person has the wherewithal and strength to overcome their inner desire to sin and they overcome it, that is called a Moshel Beitzro in the Rambam's language. That's somebody who can control their appetite, but that is not ideal because they still have the inner will inside of them to do the wrong thing. And that's a problem. That means there's something off internally about them. Rather, it's better to be a Hasid, the philosophers say. A Hasid is a pious individual who naturally naturally desires only the good. That's on one side. Let's give me a second, Paul. On the other side, we have what the Rambam quotes from Chazal. And there are various Chazals. I don't think it's one-sided. We'll see there are Chazals that go the other way. But there are various statements from the stages in the Mishnah and the Gemara that indicate that, no, it is better to overcome your temptation to sin. That is praiseworthy. So the Rambam quotes statements such as, anybody whose inclination is greater than his friend, that means he himself is greater than his friend. 
Another quote from Perkei Avot, Lefom Sagra Sa'ara Agra, that our reward is commensurate with the pain we experience in keeping Torah and mitzvot. And finally, a very well-known Chazal that speaks directly to this question, where Chazal saying, we'll read it later, it's a Sifra in Vayikra, they say a person shouldn't say, I don't want to eat pig. I don't. Uh, actually, I'll read you the direct Chazal right now. We can look at it inside later. Um, one second, please. Sorry about that. I want to get the exact language. I'll read it to you. The last Chazal goes as follows. The person shouldn't say, I don't want to wear shot knees. I don't want to eat pig. I actually love I don't want to live with that person God has said I cannot live with. Aval Eshi. I do want to. What should I do? The obvious to Beshamayim Gazar Laika. My father in heaven has decreed against this. That's what it says. The Torah says, I have separated you from the nations to be me. Nimsa, it follows that a person should be porish from Avera, separate from sin, and accept the yoke of heaven upon himself. So we see Chazal are saying, you should say, I want the pig. But Hashem said no. And the Rabbam is bothered. Who's right? The philosophers who say I should eradicate that desire inside of me? Or are these statements from the sages? So that was the question we began last week. And so before we delve into the Rambam's answer and a few more answers, I'd like to hear what you think. What do you think? What's better? What should we strive for? Should we try to overcome our temptations and to try to rid them from our uh, whole mindset? So I know Paul wanted to say something. Go for it, Paul. I was thank you for raising say, your hand. I, was, I appreciate it. I was just going to say that um, non-kosher food can smell very good. There's no yes. question about that. So why did Hashem give us the, uh, the uh, um, ability sure, sure. to appreciate good smelling food? We can't eat it. So in other words, yes, you want it because it smells great. But right, you're going to overcome that desire. Right, right. You're saying, of course, you're going to want it. It smells good. Who are you going to deny the smell? Of what course, deny the smell. I hear you. That's what you're saying. That's an interesting point. Anybody have a response to that? I hear your point. In terms of your question, why God give us the smell? I mean, I don't. I think this is sort of like an all or nothing proposition. If you wanted you to be able to smell a good, nice smelling kosher food or some nice smelling flowers. He, uh, you have to have the ability to smell. Once you can smell, it's going to work for everything, right? But I hear your point. You're saying it smells good. It smells good. What are you going to do? What am I supposed to pretend? It doesn't smell good. Like what? So hey, what, it's, easier, it's, easier to drive, it's easier to drive on Shabbos, but you, you overcome that desire. Yeah, yeah. Say, yeah those okay. are the rules. I'm not going to eat the non-kosher food. And I'm not going to drive on Shabbos. Paul, you are a student of the sages. You are a Chazal person. I like it. Very good. I like it. Anyone else? Charlie, go for it, Charlie. Um. Well, is, isn't the bottom line here really uh, one group of people believe that God is testing us and another group of people say God uh, is not testing us? Not testing us. What words, do you mean by not words, testing us? Oh, sorry? What do you mean by that? He's not testing us. He's not. Well, the philosophers, right? They believe you shouldn't even have it on your mind. So... God, God shouldn't be testing you at all. This is not. I'm gonna, here's my question: If I'm an Aristotelian philosopher, how do I respond to Paul's question? Right? Let's say you know you're walking by the Cinnabon or whatever it is, and it smells good. So you turn to Aristotle and you say, "What are you? Did you not smell it? It smells great. Like, what do you want from me? What do you want from me? I'm not supposed to want it. How do you respond to that, Charlie?" How is it not a test? It's a test. I want it. What are you going to? Well, no, but the philosophers are saying, right, that you shouldn't even want. Right. To... They're saying that. But I think Paul, oh, makes, a good... but, I think but... Paul makes a good point. So but... what does that mean then? I shouldn't want it. But I do. You? I want it. It smells good. I'm hungry. Well, if you want it and you're hungry, you know you're not supposed to eat it. So in, in that particular 
thing. God is God is testing you. Okay, but, so now we're back to the uh, other opinion that you have to overcome your inclination, right? And then, by the way, they would agree. But how? What? But, but I think by the what the question is. Well, what are they saying? How are you supposed to overcome that? And I think the answer, by the way, the only answer that is possible is that a person has to um, get to the point where they are not so prone to temptation, to physical temptation. A person has to get to the point where they have such good control <laughs> over their desires that even if something smells good, that good, I guess, olfactory reaction doesn't necessarily lead them to this temptation. Say a person's on a, on a diet, for instance, right? Right. So maybe you've experienced this. Maybe you get to the point where you look at that thing that you used to like and you say, I don't want it anymore. I don't want it. I don't want it. Right. You're on a diet. And I think that happens to people, you know, you know, uh, take it for a very basic example. I think a vegetarian or a vegan, well, I look at a nice steak and say, ah, get Valdic. I want some of that steak. A vegan will look at that and say, no, I don't want to even want that. There, there's no temptation not overcoming anything. They've, they've trained themselves to not want certain things. So I think the answer to your question, Paul, would be to say, you're right, it smells good. But the philosopher would tell you, work on yourself to the point where those things that, you, that smell good but are not good for you are no longer temptations because you've internalized the point that they're not even desirable, just like a vegetarian doesn't even want to eat steak. Rabbi Bergman. I think it's yes, it's a much more complex question question that Paul posed than uh, than it, to have a simple answer. It's two fundamentally different theories and philosophies in I terms agree of what the what the Greek philosophy is versus the philosophy that the rabbis have tried to introduce with regards to out perspective and outlook towards life and values. Uh, and that that was part of uh, what was happening even during the time of uh, why we have Hanukkah and the Hasmoneans. Right. I mean, that right. went, this went on for centuries. OK, so I think I think you're right. I think what Andrew is getting to is the following question here. We'll delve into the text. We'll share the Rambam's perspective on this. I think he has one perspective and I'd like to challenge it from both ends. So the question I think Andrew is posing by two philosophies is why are things wrong or not wrong? What makes something good or not good, right? So is so it, uh, do we go about making, I guess, independent sort of evaluations and saying something is wrong because it's wrong. I have an internal compass. I have some sort of sense within me, whether it's a sense of right and wrong or morality, maybe it's some spiritual sense by which I use my sort of uh, thermometer to detect whether something's wrong or not. And if it's wrong, then I shouldn't want it. And that's what makes it wrong. And maybe God gives us commandments to give us a clue to sort of, you know, help us attune, attune our spiritual thermometers, right? But really things are wrong because they're wrong, you know, or they're bad for you, etc. Versus the other theory, which is it's not that it's wrong because it's wrong. God is the one who determines whether something's wrong. And the reason that things are wrong is because God said they're wrong. And, you know, other than that, that is the basis of right and wrong. There is really no other sort of morality. So the Rambam's going to make a split here, as we're going to see. The Rambam's going to say the answer to that question really depends on what we're talking about. So let's take a look at the Rambam. Let's see what you think about it. And then I want to challenge the Rambam on both, both his assumptions here. So I'm going to share my screen. Actually, just give me one second. Um, I'm going to share this screen. I'm going to make it full screen. Maybe that's the wrong one. Sorry about that. Let me let me stop for a second. Give me a second. Sorry about that. It doesn't look the way I wanted it to. Um, here we go. Let's go back here. Beautiful. And make a full screen. Beautiful. So hopefully this will be legible. Let me share again a little. And here we go. Here's the wrong bomb. We read the beginning of this last week. Let's just get back into the question and then let's see his answer. Here we go. So I'm going to read it in English. Um, for our time's sake, but feel free to read the Hebrew. It's obviously the original language. Philosophers maintain that through the, though the man of self-restraint performs moral and praiseworthy deeds, the man of self-restraint, the Rambam's term, hamoshel benafsho, someone who has desire to do evil but controls themselves. Yet he does them desiring and craving all the while for immoral deeds, 
but subduing his passions and actively fighting against the longing to do those things to which his faculties, his desires, and psychic disposition excite him, succeeds, though with constant vexation and irritation acting more. Right? That's the Moshal Benafsho. He has a lot, the, he or she, she has a lot of self control. But it's hard. It's painful. Ah, oh, I want that, but I can't have it. Oh, I don't want to do that, but I have to do it. That's one person. The saintly man, the Hasid, in the Ramam's terminology, however, is guided in his actions by that to which his inclination and disposition prompt him. Right? The moral compass. The moral compass guides him. In consequence of which he acts morally from innate longing and desire. Philosophers unanimously agree that the latter is superior to and more perfect than the one who has the curb his passions, although they add that it is possible for such a person to equal the saintly man in many regards. In general, however, he must necessarily be ranked lower in the scale of virtue because there lurks within him the desire to do evil. And though he does not do it yet because his inclinations are all in that direction, it denotes the presence of an immoral psychic disposition. You have something wrong in you. There's something immoral inside of you. If you want something that's bad for you, it means there's something internally off. Your moral compass is, is not quite on. That's the philosophers. And he quotes Shlomo Melech from scripture. Solomon also entertained the same idea when he said in Mishle, the soul of the wicked desires evil. And in return, regards the saintly man's rejoicing in doing good. And the discontent experienced by him who is not innately righteous when required to act justly, he says, it is bliss to the righteous to do justice, but torments the evildoer. The righteous person is happy about justice. That's the sign. How do you know if someone's righteous? How do you know if someone's righteous? It's not just by what they do. It's by how they feel when they do it. If you are happy to do justice, that means you're righteous. But if you, if it's a torment, if it's, oh, oh my gosh, I have to go through with this, that is an evildoer. This is manifestly in agreement between scripture and philosophy. So we have Mishleon and the philosophers on one hand. Whenever we consult the rabbi, the Chachamim, on the subject, it would seem that they consider him who desires iniquity and craves for it, but does not do it, more praiseworthy and perfect and the one who feels no torment ever refrain from evil. And they even go so far as to maintain that the more praiseworthy and perfect a man is, the greater is his desire to commit iniquity. And the more irritation does he feel at having to desist from it. It's the opposite. Whereas in Mishle, it says, the righteous rejoice in justice. In the Gemara, it says, the greater temptation you have, the greater you are. This they express by saying, whosoever is greater than his neighbor has likewise greater evil inclination. Again, as if this were not sufficient, they go even go so far as to say that the reward of him who overcomes his evil inclination is commensurate with the torture occasioned by his resistance. It's not just that they're greater. It's that you get rewarded better the more, the harder it is. The harder it is the more reward you get, okay? And that, um, which they thought they expressed by the words, again, the fumsar agra, according to labor is the reward. Furthermore, they command that man should conquer his desires, but they forbid one to say, I by my nature do not desire to commit such and such a transgression, even though the law does not forbid it. Rabbi Shemigel Neal summed up his thought in the words, man should not say, I do not want to eat meat together with milk. I do not want to wear clothes made of, of a mixture of wool and linen. I do not want to enter an incestuous marriage. Man should not say that, but he should say, I do indeed want to, yet I must not. For my father in heaven has forbidden it. So that's the, that's the contradiction, that's the conflict. Paul has raised his hand. Yes, Paul. You're, you're muted, my friend. Rabbi. You've got two steaks on the barbecue. One is kosher and one is not kosher. The problem, because if you're on the same barbecue, 
Okay, so you got two barbecues side by <laughs> each. Your line, one's sorry. got a kosher steak on it, and one's got a non-kosher steak. They're both ribeye steaks. One's kosher, one's not kosher. They smell exactly the same. Yeah. I hear. What's How are you supposed question? to want one, not the other? You have to know one's kosher and one's not. And then right. So knowledge. then you, but but you still have the desire to eat both steaks, but you know one's kosher, one's not kosher. So you're only well, going to eat well, the kosher one. I'm interesting. Like I walk, I mean, maybe others experience this too. I have grown up religious and eating kosher and not eating not kosher, such that when I drive by a non-kosher restaurant, I don't have some sort of like innate desire to go in there because it's just off limits to me. So I think of a person, again, like you're making it very extreme. You already had the steak right there in front of you. It looks exactly the same. So that makes it more challenging. But I don't think it's so crazy to say that you can train yourself to not even, once you become accustomed to living a certain way, it might not even be a desire to have that other thing. It's just off limits. It's not even a thought. Right, but I do want to. Before we get to more points, I want to look at the Ram's answer. Okay, so let's hold the thoughts for a second. Let's Rabbi, can I ask you a question first? Okay, just for you. Thank you. You you succumbed. <laughs> just for you, I gave it. Okay. I gave it. Appreci appreciate it. In terms of what the Rambam said before, with respect to it being a greater achievement if it's a greater task that someone's attempting to overcome, is yeah. that? On, a, on an isolated basis, or is that a recurring theme for the same individual? Like, I, do you reach a threshold when, right. when you can no longer say that, that that's the case? I hear what you're saying. I totally hear what you're saying. I think we'll get to that sort of idea. Maybe there's a trajectory. Maybe you start off wanting something that's not good for you, but you conquer it and you conquer it and it's painful and it's more painful and it ultimately gets less painful. Ultimately, you don't even want it anymore. Is that your suggesting? <laughs> Yeah, the, the first time you become yeah. aware of it, conscious of this, and you have, you struggle to make the choice, it's different than if you you have you've done it fifty times. Good point. Good point. So let's look at the Rambam's answer. I hear what you're saying totally. So let's see what the Rambam says here. At first blush, by a superficial comparison of the sayings of the philosophers and the rabbis, one might be inclined to say that they contradict one another. Just pausing here, as you were last week, you know. A lot of people would not be bothered by this contradiction. A lot of people would say, you know, I guess the more from religious people would say to heck with the philosophers and we'll go with the rabbis. And maybe those who are more secular would say, who cares what the rabbis say? We'll go with the philosophers. But the Rambam is a very religious philosopher. So he's not so satisfied simply saying there's a contradiction and we'll pick a side. So the Rambam has to solve this. Such, however, is not the case. Rambam says it is not a contradiction. Both are correct and, moreover, are not in disagreement in the least. How? Says the Rambam, it depends on what we're talking about. There are certain things we should not even desire. Even if God, if God's, there are things that God forbid us to partake in or activities we have to refrain from participating in that we should not even want. And then there are certain things where it's not a problem to want it. And we just don't do it because Hashem says so. That's the Rambam split. As the evils which the philosophers term such, of which they say, he who has no longing for them is more to be praised than he who desires them, but conquers his passions. What are the sorts of things which the philosophers would like us to not even have a desire for? They are things which are all people commonly agree are evils. Such as the shedding of blood, right? Shvichet in murder, theft, robbery, fraud, injury to one who has done no harm, ingratitude, contempt for parents, and the like. These are things everybody agrees is evil. This, the prescription, prescriptions against these are called commandments, mitzvot, about which the rabbi said in Yoma 67b, if they had not already been written in the law, it will be proper to add them. They're intuitive. There are intuitive commandments, not murdering, not stealing from one another, Frankly, what do we see about all the examples the Rambam has given? What sort of mitzvot are they? Again, 
shedding blood, theft, robbery, fraud, injury to one who has done no harm, right? Mazik. What do all those have in common in terms of categorizing mitzvot, would you say? Negative. They're negative. Negative. Okay. What else? Exactly. They're between a person in interpersonal relationships, between a man and his friend. All the things in between a man and his friend, the Rambam says, we have an intuitive sense. If our moral compasses are appropriately engineered, we have an intuitive sense. Murder is wrong. Theft is wrong. All those things are wrong. Some of our later sages who were infected with the unsound principle of the Mutkalit Laimun, I don't know how to pronounce that. That's some sort of Islamic philosophical school that the Rama was familiar with, call these rational laws. Rational laws. Sikhliot, mitzvot sikhliot. There is no doubt that a soul which has the desire for and lust after the above mentioned misdeed is imperfect that a noble soul has absolutely no desire for any such crime and experiences no struggle in refraining from them, right? Says the Rambam, if a person has, I don't know, they're walking down the street and they're walking behind a kindly old person with their wallet sticking out of their pocket and it is there for the taken, they'll never know. The Rambam says, if you have a temptation to take advantage of that person, that disadvantaged weak person and steal their wallet and you just overcome it. Oh, I really, really want to steal the wallet, but uh, you know what? God said I can't. And there's something wrong with you. There's something wrong with you. Your soul is imperfect. Why would you have such a desire to take advantage of a person and to steal that which does not belong to you and it belongs to another person? That's wrong. You know it's wrong. And if you still have a desire to do it, that means you have to work on yourself. You have to get to the point where that, whether that knowledge of the wrong and that clear tendency to avoid those things which are wrong is stronger than whatever I, I, temptation you had to take it from that person. That's a problem if it's not that way. That a noble soul has absolutely no desire for any such crimes and experiences no struggle in refraining from them. When, however, the rabbis maintain that he who overcomes his desire has more merit and a greater reward, that it's better to have temptation and overcome it, they say so only in reference to laws that are ceremonial prohibitions. Ceremonial. Hatorot hashimiyot. That's what he's calling them. Shimiyot is an interesting word. But things that are usher, they're forbidden because the Torah says so. This is quite true. I'm not, I don't like the translation ceremonial here. Hatorot hashimiyo is means the things that the Torah taught to us that are that are forbidden. That's what it means. This is quite true. Since were it not for the law, they would not at all be considered transgressions. Therefore, the rabbis say that a man should permit his soul to entertain the natural inclination for these things but that the law alone should reframe him from them. Ponder over the wisdom of these men of blessed memory, manifest in the examples they adduce. Meaning it's not, it's no coincidence what the, what the, what the, what the um, rabbis chose. They do not declare, men should not say, I have no desire to kill, to steal, and to lie, but I have a desire for these things. Yet what can I do? Since my father in heaven forbids it. They don't say, you know, I really, really, really wish I can murder the next person that walks across the street. I want to. But Hashem said no. That's not what they say. That person would be perverted. The instances they cite are all from, again, the translation here says ceremonial law. The Rambam certain is Tarot Hashemiot, such as partaking of meat and milk together, wearing clothes made of wool and linen, and entering into, and I'm going to be honest, I'm not sure how to pronounce this word, consang consanguinous marriages. Anybody know what that word is saying? <laughs> Ralph, do you know? Is that some sort of old English? That, that's Holistic incest. And moral. It's it, incest. It, it's forbidden it, sexual relationships. Yeah. That's what it means. I don't, it, I don't know what that word is. It's anyway. incest. It's incest. Saying, it means incest the same that, blood. But they're, not, they're not all incest. Okay. No need to dwell on that. Anyways, he's saying 
Now, Rabbi. interesting examples. Let me just finish the paragraph for a second. Interesting examples. But that's what he's saying. These are things that they would have been fine. And the Torah says no. That's why. These and similar accounts are called, called my statutes. Chukot, chukim, chukim. Maybe you've heard the difference between chukim and mishpatim. Chukim is something that I wouldn't have intuitively thought should be off limits. And the Torah decrees it's off limits. And that's why it's forbidden. As opposed to mitzvot, what the Rambam says, or mishpatim, we're just sensible. It has to be this is forbidden. Intuitively, I know it's wrong. Which, as the rabbis say, are statutes, which I have enacted for thee, I meaning God, which you have no right to subject to criticism, which the nations of the world attack, and which Satan denounces. As, for instance, the statutes concerning the red heifer, the paraduma, the scapegoat, the Seirah Mishaleach, the goat we send off to the mountain of Yom Kippur, and so forth. Right? It's, they're not very intuitive. In fact, the, in, there's what to say about the examples he gave. They're not just not intuitive, they're perplexing. Let's take the scapegoat, for example. What's this notion of a scapegoat? We can dump our sins in an animal? How does that even work? It makes no sense, logically. But Hashem said we do it. So that's what we do. And the nations of the world might be making fun of you and they're saying, this is ridiculous. Look at the Jews. They think they can dump their sins in a goat and, and banish it off of a cliff. What a crazy Torah they're keeping. And Hashem says, listen, I'm telling you, this is what I want you to do. Don't question it. Those transgressions, however, which the later sages called rational laws, are termed commandments, not chukim, but mitzvot, as the rabbis explain. It is now evident from all that we have said what the transgressions are for, which if a man had no desire at all, he is on a higher plane than he who has longing, but controls his passion for them. And it is also evident what the transgressions are of which the opposite is true. It is an astonishing fact that these two classes of expression should be shown to be compatible with one another, but their content points to the truth of our explanation. This ends the discussion of the subject matter of this chapter. <laughs> so that is the Rambam's answer to the question. Should I naturally not want to sin or should I not sin? Because Hashem said so. It depends on the topic. If it's what the Rambam is calling a, an intuitive sin mitzvot, and he gave examples of intrapersonal laws, theft, fraud, murder. No effect laws. So those Noahide laws, interesting, although not all Noahide laws are, you know, interper you know, some of those may be a little bit sort of like, you know, in incest is one of them. The Rambam seems like it categorizes that in the other category. But anyways, all the straightforward intuitive laws, that I shouldn't even want. But the other things the Rambam is calling Toro Chimio, things like not eating not kosher, etc., maybe things like not wearing shot knees. Those are, those are laws which they're, fra they're a problem because Hashem said so. And for those, I can entertain my desire for them, but ultimately I control myself. And that is totally praiseworthy. Perfect. So now at this point, I'd like to know, and uh, I like the raising your hand thing, I have to say, because it makes it easier when I don't have to yell at a, a lot of people at once. So uh, if you can make use of that icon, that'd be great. Um, I'd like to hear your thoughts. What do you think? What do you think of each of these propositions? What do you think of the proposition that we should not desire those things which are intuitively forbidden? And what do you think of the proposition that we should desire those things which are forbidden because God said so? And do you, do you, let's say it this way, do you recognize such a distinction? Do you think there should be any distinction? Rabbi. What do we think? Paul raises his hand. Go yeah, for it. Can we go, can we go back a step? Uh, I just want to say on one second. We'll take it a second, Andrew. Go for it, Paul. Uh, I, I, I find it easy to understand when you talk about walking down the street with the wallet in someone's back pocket. But the line blurs when you talk about business ethics. When you talk about what's right and what's wrong. I right. don't think that I don't think that you can make such distinctions that you're trying to make or the Rumbum's trying to make when you talk about things like business ethics and how you treat people, how you treat your employees, 
uh, how how you price goods out and how you how you conduct right. your business. The, the, those are very very difficult issues when you talk uh, of what, what's right and what's wrong here and what you desire and what you don't desire. There's a fine line between desiring something and violating a rule or a regulation. And I guess that's why we have the courts. I hear you. You know, what I would say to that is I would distinguish between difficulty and something being intuitive. Meaning there might be a case in which there's a very fine line where it's shady, it's foggy. You know, maybe you can get away with paying your employee a little bit less, even though they deserve more. Let's say that for, and there, by the way, you should know there's lots of halachot and laws and a section of the Talmud dedicated to those sort of laws, employee laws. Um, but it might be foggy, but that doesn't mean that it's not intuitive. And I think what the Ramba might say is that, again, and this doesn't mean it's easy. And it doesn't mean, and I'm going to be very clear, as Ramam's not saying it's you're bad if you struggle and overcome it. Rambam is just saying if you didn't even have the struggle, that would be better. So if we took, let's say, honest Abe, Abraham Lincoln, right? Assuming he was the paradigm of honesty in business. And if honest Abe was in that situation, he would be so dedicated to honesty that he wouldn't even have in that foggy situation the tendency to, to lie or to be dishonest or to cut corners, et cetera. That doesn't mean that everybody's going to be that way. It may very well be that some people will have that tendency and have to overcome it. It may be very well be that some people will have the tendency and they won't overcome it. And you know, we have plenty of stories of people doing that sort of thing. But in terms of what is the greatest, the Rambam would say the greatest is if you are so honest that you're not even compelled to cheat. Okay, go for it, Andrew. Uh, I, I, I'm wondering whether or not what you're talking about, whether the distinction could be categorized in a somewhat different way. Uh, laws that the philosophers are referring to, which are required, and I use the term laws loosely. Okay. Uh, that are required for society at large to function versus what Rumba may be referring to, laws that relate specifically to the Israelites that may overlap with those same laws, may be very identical in some respects. However, the reason for following them is because of a higher order and right. dealing, dealing with spirituality and so forth. And right. And although they may on the surface appear to be identical, and they may well be identical, but the intention is different. I hear that. I, I'm gonna. And, that's a great point. And then, it's and a great then point you're making. The question is, I wanted, I, can I just come back to something that Paul said? The law with regards to the two steaks, whether they are on the same barbecue or two separate barbecues, <laughs> that is not going to affect society being able to function. But in terms of from a, if you're a member of the Israelite family, spiritually, it makes a huge difference whether or not those two stakes are right. interchangeable. Right. Right. So I think you're kind of saying what Ralph was saying before. It's similar. Ralph was saying it's the seven Noahide laws. Well, if like I'm that saying sort the same thing. thing as Ralph was saying, then it's got to be right. Yeah, yeah. I hear you. I hear you. You know, I hear that. You know, he's got a great moral compass for sure. Um, I don't know. It happens to be that there are, I think, laws which the Ramba might say are intuitive, um, but are not included in the seven Noahide laws. Now, this is a different discussion, but there are various laws and mitzvot that, re that relate to honesty and business, etc. that are not one of the seven Noahide laws. The seven Noahide laws include not stealing and they include dinim, which is setting up courts and their own judicial system. And there is a debate what that judicial system should consist of and do they have to have the same business laws? But assuming they don't, so something like paying the worker on time, right? There's a biblical requirement to pay your worker on time and to not make them wait for their pay. That's in the Torah. Now, that's not included in the seven Noahide laws. 
but I think you could argue that it is a law that does contribute to the functioning of society, right? And maybe even if a non-Jew isn't obligated in that, but maybe they should have a natural a desire to pay their workers in time. So I'm just saying in terms of categorization, I'm not sure it's the same thing as the seven Noahide laws. What I do want to do now is attack the Rambam for a second. I'm going to attack the Rambam. I'm going to, I'm going to suggest that you don't have to take this sort of categorization the way the Rambam says it. I think that the Rambam is saying, I think, um, making the following two statements to me. The Rambam is, sounds like to me, the way I understand it, the Rambam is saying that regarding the intuitive set of laws, and you can phrase them how you want to, laws that are necessary for the functioning of society, you know, laws that govern the relationships between people. The Rambam to me is sort of saying that you shouldn't want to do them because of your internal sense of right and wrong, moral and immoral. That you should have an internal moral compass that directs you not to do those things. And that's all you need. Whereas something like, let's take not eating pig, because I just want to say for the record, I actually find it surprising. I don't think it's great for the Ramb on this point, but something obviously a sensitive topic, let's say incest, incest. Do you really mean to tell me that that is just, you know what, it should have been totally fine, but the Torah happens to forbid it? I'm not saying it's so clear either way. I definitely think that there are certain people who would argue that for the good order of society, there are certain people that we should not marry or cohabit with, right? So if you want to say incest is a good example of that, you think that's a compelling argument. I'm not so sure that I should have a desire for that, and I don't thank God, but God said it's off limits, right? I feel like most people wouldn't agree with that example. But be that as it may, be that as it may, I think there's another point here. All of those commandments, it seems to me what the Rambam is saying, is they're sort of like, and the Rambam gives reasons for all the mitzvot in Mor Nebuchadnezzar, and maybe we'll go, and it relates to the question of reasons for mitzvot. But based on the Rambam's treatment here, it's almost like, you know what? Why is pig a problem? I have absolutely no idea. Maybe pig is totally okay, really? Rasham said so. It's almost like it's kind of arbitrary like you know it, it's there's nothing also, inherently wrong with it it's God also knows. easier than having to think it out for yourself right now the Rambam I want to say the Rambam does believe in looking for the reasons for all mitzvot and he seen has this notion that it all relates to weaning the Jewish people off of their pagan outlook and their pagan lifestyle that existed in uh in the times when the Torah was given but that being said, this notion that, you know what, you should want to eat the pig, you should entertain the desire. But Hashem said, no, I'm not sure. Because you could argue that God is not giving us an arbitrary list of do's and don'ts, but that list of do's and don'ts reveals something about either the nature of the world or more appropriately, the, what is necessary for our spiritual growth, even if we don't understand it. Such that you could say, you know what? I don't know why pig is bad for me. But if Hashem said it's forbidden, then pig obviously is bad for me. And therefore, I should get to the point where I do not desire it because Hashem is telling me it's bad for me. So I want to explore both of these points with you. Um, we'll read a few sources inside. I'll say the other one outside. And I think it's also going to relate to Andrew's point. Because the question is, I'm not sure even that I should ever simply rely on only my internal compass. Because I would argue that a person's internal compass, while a very important tool and our sense of morality is really important, it could also be flawed and people make mistakes. And so I could also argue that even in terms of the things, stealing, et cetera, that the reason I, all, I, I should understand why it's wrong, I should have a sense that it's wrong to steal, it's dishonest, et cetera. But ultimately, I also don't do it because Hashem wrote in the Torah that it's wrong. And that is a pillar based on which I can direct my life. So let me just share a few sources with you. And um, 
hopefully it provides a few of some food for thought. I'm going to uh, just give me one second. I'm gonna just navigate to this other screen for a second. Eleven. There we go. Just just three sources that I want to share. Um, and then I'll say another one outside. Okay, so let's take a look at these two first sources again. So first, I want to make the following point. The Rambam sort of saw this as it's Hazal, it's the sages versus the philosophers. Philosophers say, yay. I mean, sorry, the philosophers say you shouldn't want to do evil. And the rabbis say you should, but you should overcome it. Not so simple. The first source we have here is the source that the Rambam quoted, right? It's, we read it before, no need to read it again. A person should not say, I don't want to do X, Y, and Z. Rather, they should say, I do want it, but Hashem decreed that I shouldn't have it. But then what he, but look what he says at the end here. Mimsa porish min havera umikabel alav ol malchut shemayim. The moral is that a person's abstinence from sin should lead to them accepting the yoke of heaven, should lead them to be more God-fearing. So one question to ask here is, are the rabbis, is the point the rabbis are making that these laws are arbitrary? Or is the point the rabbis are making that not everything is going to be intuitive and don't pretend that it's just some sort of natural thing. Like, ah, oh, pig is yucky. Pig might be very good. But the reason you don't eat pig is because Hashem ultimately declared that you shouldn't. It's about the why. The why question. Why don't we do certain things? That's important, which Andrew was saying before. So that's one chazal. I want to share with you this chazal, though, and tell me the impression that you get from it. If the Rambam is correct, if the sages think you should want all these things, and yet um, you just don't do it because Hashem said so. Look at this Mishnah. Omer, he would say, make your will, make his will, his will being the will of God, like your will. Make God's will your will. So that in return, he will do your will as if it was his will. Set aside your will in, in the faith of his will. So that he should set aside the will of others for your will. What do you think it means, you should make your will like his will, that we should make our ratzon, our will, our desires congruous with God's desire? What does that mean? What do you think? What do you think, Ralph? What does that mean? We should make our will like his will. What do we think? Our will should be the same as God's. What is that saying? What is a person's will? What is a person's ratzon? Go for it, Kay. Tell me, sorry. I can't. We should want to do what Hashem wants us to do. That's what it sounds like, right? You should want to do what Hashem wants us to do. Is this saying... So that he will do what we want. Right. So that's the interesting... These, these two don't relate to each other very well. Well, these, the first half, the we second half. Of the we the should do his example. will so that he will do something for us doesn't make any sense. Well, the Ra-Ra well, says... Ralph, oh, Ralph, I'm not that should be your Ralph, intention. Think something else. Saying something else, Ralph. Well, just give me a second, because we're, we're running out of time here. I don't, I wanted to focus the first part, but the Maral is a really nice idea here. I will say that. I appreciate it. The Maral says that what you want to happen is that you are on God's side. You want to have that connection such that what you want in life is what Hashem wants. You want to do Ratzon Hashem. 
And if a person does that, no. if a person commits themselves to the point that their will is God's will, but, Hashem is also saying in return that he will also help you out. His will will be your will. Now you might, you don't like that, that's okay. But I think that's the point. But that, be that as it may, does this Mishnah just say that your will, whatever it is, but you have to overcome your desire? To me, it's indicating that we should get to the point where our ultimate goal is Ratzon Hashem. And that's what we want. And that if Hashem doesn't want something for us, then we shouldn't want it for us either. Not that we should want it, but we say, eh, you know what, I'm not going to do it because Hashem says no. But that ultimately, I think this relates to what Andrew was saying before, because contrast these two statements. One says, make your will like his will. One says, put aside your will. Put aside your will because of his will, which means if you want to do something, but Hashem doesn't want it, put his will first. So you could look at this as two different scenarios. That's one interpretation. That positively, when Hashem wants you to do something, you should also want to do it. If Hashem wants you to give tzedakah, it shouldn't be that you say, oh, oh my gosh, more money. Who is this person? And then you just give it anyway. It should be, I want to give tzedakah. And then, and then in a situation in which you don't want to, you say, look, Hashem said, this is what I have to do. That's Batel Ritzon. But maybe it's a progression, like Andrew said before. Maybe ultimately the goal is you get to the point where your Ritzon is Ritzon Hashem. But until that happens, even if that's not so, the, the Meshna is telling you, you know what? Sometimes you're going to want some things. And Hashem says you shouldn't want them. And you have to give up those things that you want for the sake of his will. So to me, I'm just, I'm just going to finish. And I'll take your questions for a few minutes afterward. To me, that I don't think it's so clear from Chazal. I think Chazal do understand that ultimately our will is important. The things that you want, the things that you yearn for, the things that, you, that, that, that really drive you are controllable. I think that's another point that they're making. Meaning, yes. Use the time if you walk by something and it smells good, you're going to want it. But what ultimately is your driving force in life? What ultimately animates you? What ultimately motivates you? And this is something it's like Arama says, Akira Yitzhak. And he argues, you know what? I think, and I think he's right, we should never only rely on my internal sense of right and wrong. Because think about it. If I say, you know what? I'm not going to do X, Y, and Z because it's wrong. I don't know. Take not kosher. To take uh, stealing, for example. I'm not going to steal because it's wrong. That's why I think it's wrong. Well, what if it, you come to a situation where it's not so wrong in your mind? I don't know. This person is rotten. They're horrible. They've done so much to, to harm people with their money. And now I have the opportunity to take advantage of that. I'm going to do it. Or it's just foggy. It's one of those difficult situations. In that situation, relying on your sister in internal sense might not be enough. But if it's just God said, I can't do X, Y, and Z, then that's the way it is. Even if I don't sense why in this specific circumstance it should be forbidden, Hashem said it's forbidden. So that's one point to make. Point being, I think ultimately, even in regard to those mitzvah which are intuitive, why don't I steal? Why don't I do X, Y, and Z? Why don't I cheat? Why am I not ungrateful? It's two reasons. It's because I know internally that it's wrong. And ultimately, it's because I want to do Ratz and Hashem, and Ratz and Hashem has dictated that thus such behavior is off limits. That's point one. Point B is in regards to the other things. Not kosher. Is not kosher just arbitrary? Is it just random? So Maral says no. And the Maral says as follows, and I'm, I won't read it inside now for time's sake. It's not that pig is arbitrary, but it's also not just, you know, a very basic, simple reason. Meaning, what Chazal means to say is, don't look at pig and say, you know why Hashem told you not to eat pig? It's not healthy. 
It must be it's not healthy. Or it's some sort of naturalistic reason. What Chazal are saying is that God made certain things forbidden because he understood that those things are spiritually harmful for us. That mitzvot are there for us to reach our spiritual potential. And if it's forbidden, that means it is an impediment to me reaching my spiritual potential. Ah, uh, I don't understand why. What's wrong with the pig? What does the pig have to do with me reaching my spiritual potential? Why is it bad for my soul? That's where Chazal are saying, that's where you got to have faith. But it's not to say that it's arbitrary, that really it should just be fine. It's a problem for you because God said it's an Avera, which means he's revealing to you that that sort of thing is a problem for your spiritual well-being. So that is to say, I don't think the distinction between intuitive and not too into, not intuitive is so clear. I'm not sure that's the way we should look at things. And I think ultimately both are important. I think we need to get to the point where we understand things as best as we can. That even those things are hard to understand. Could become to a sense intuitive. Become not just arbitrary. It's not just arbitrary and random. I don't do X, Y, and Z. But I don't do it because if Hashem said I shouldn't do it, it means it's bad for me. It's actually bad for me. That's one. And two, and two, even those things which are naturally or intuitively wrong, that's one reason I don't do them. But I also don't do them because Hashem said they're wrong. And if Hashem's ratzon is that I shouldn't do such a thing, then I want that to be my ratzon also. So I'll end with this. I hope you found this thought-provoking and meaningful. <laughs> And I bless us all with both a very highly attuned, refined sense of right and wrong that even in the most difficult, foggy situations, we should have something inside of us saying that if something's wrong, I can't do it. But also the awareness that ultimately it's not only what about what I think is wrong, but I subscribe to a higher power. That higher power is the will of God. And that is ultimately the will that I attend to live my life according to. Thank you, everybody. Ooh. Appreciate your thoughts. Happy oh. to stay a few minutes for a few.